Hi, this is Matt Baker. Welcome to Episode 8 in my series on the Christian Denominations Family Tree. In this video, I'm going to cover a bunch of groups that didn't really fit into any of the previous categories. This will include Unitarians, Christian Scientists, Messianic Jews, and many more. But first, I'm pleased to announce that the poster version is now complete and ready to purchase. You can get your copy right now by heading over to UsefulCharts.com. We also just released a new version of our Biblical Family Tree, so take note that if you buy both, you automatically get 10% off. I also want to take this opportunity to thank everyone who helped with the project by giving feedback in the comments. One last-minute change that was a direct result of the comment section was the inclusion of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Finland. I also decided to sneak in the Church in Wales, since it just didn't seem right to have England, Ireland, and Scotland represented in the Anglican section, but not Wales. Okay, so for today's video, let's start with Unitarian Universalism. I had actually added this group to the chart a while back, but forgot to talk about them. So let me do that now. As the name suggests, Unitarian Universalism is actually the result of two different movements that eventually merged, Unitarianism and Universalism. A Unitarian with a small u is basically anyone who believes in the oneness of God and who rejects ideas such as the Trinity or the divinity of Jesus. So, in this sense, all Jews and Muslims are Unitarians. However, a Unitarian with a capital U is someone who belongs to one of the various Unitarian movements that grew out of Protestant Christianity. The earliest of these Unitarian movements were actually based in Eastern Europe, but eventually there were movements in the UK and US as well. In the US, Unitarianism grew out of Congregationalism, and it became official in 1825, when the American Unitarian Association was formed. Universalism is quite different. It's the idea that, ultimately, all humans will receive salvation. In other words, no one is going to hell. This idea became popular in some churches around the same time as Unitarianism, and in 1793, the Universalist Church of America was formed. Over time, Unitarians and Universalists became two of the most liberal denominations in America, and in 1961, because they had so much in common, they decided to merge to form the Unitarian Universalist Association. Now, take note that I have not placed Unitarian Universalism in a colored box, like all the other denominations on this chart. This is because they are non-Trinitarian, and thus non-Nicene. In fact, one could argue that they aren't even a part of Christianity anymore. But instead of drawing a line all the way down to the non-Nicene Christians box, I opted instead to show them as a black and white symbol, like I did for Judaism and Islam, to indicate that they're more of a separate religion, rather than a part of Christianity. In contrast, another very progressive group that definitely is still a branch within Christianity is the Metropolitan Community Church, which started out as a single non-denominational congregation but has since grown into its own denomination. It was founded in 1968 by a gay man named Troy Perry, who wanted to start a church where gay and lesbian Christians could feel welcome. Starting in 1969, the church started performing the very first public same-sex marriages in the United States, although those marriages weren't recognized as being legal in California until 2008. To this day, the Metropolitan Community Church is mostly made up of members from the LGBT community. However, it does have many straight members as well. Let me now point out the Catholic Apostolic Church better known to outsiders as the Irvingian Church, named after its founder, Edward Irving, from Scotland. 
I probably should have mentioned them in episode 6, alongside the Restorationists, because not only did they emerge around the same time, they also have a lot in common with them, in that they see themselves as restoring the original structure of the early church, and that they are quite focused on the Second Coming. However, please note that nowadays the original Irvingian church has mostly died away and has been replaced by the new apostolic church, which started off as a splinter group in 1863 and is mostly based in continental Europe. Another group that has roots in Scotland are the Two by Twos. They were started by a Scotsman named William Irvine, who was initially loosely connected to the Higher Life movement. He ended up in Ireland, where he began an independent ministry that focused on sending out preachers in groups of two. These pairs, called Go Preachers, were to have no salary and no home, and thus they also became known as Tramp Preachers. One of the early Tramp Preachers was a man named Edward Cooney. Although he was eventually expelled, he continued to grow the movement on his own, and thus some two-by-twos became known as Cooneyites. Nowadays, the 2 by 2s are a rather secretive group, with no official name. They do, however, reject the Trinity, which is why I've placed them in the non-Nicene box. If you want to learn more about this mysterious group, I suggest that you watch today's video by Ready to Harvest, which is all about the church with no name. Another non-Nicene group of Christians that are very loosely organized are the Christadelphians whose name is based on the Greek phrase Christu Adelphoi, which means brothers and sisters in Christ. Their founder, John Thomas, was originally connected to the Stone Campbell movement, which is why I've shown them as descending from that branch. I'd now like to focus on what I've called the metaphysical groups, starting with the Swedenborgians, also known as the New Church. Their name comes from that of Emanuel Swedenborg, who, as you might have guessed, was from Sweden. He believed that humans become either angels or demons after death, and that previous humans, now living in the form of spirits, are all around us on a daily basis, trying to guide us towards good or evil. He died in 1772, and 15 years later, some of his followers established a church in England based on his ideas. And from there, it also spread to the U.S. The most famous Swedenborgian is probably John Chapman, better known as Johnny Appleseed. Although he's now mostly associated with folk legends, Johnny Appleseed was actually a real person who, in addition to being a new church missionary, also helped to introduce apple trees to many U.S. states. Another key person in the development of certain metaphysical ideas was a man named Franz Mesmer. He's the person that the word mesmerism is based on, which nowadays is mostly used to mean hypnotism. But originally, mesmerism was more than just hypnotism. Also known as animal magnetism, it centered on the idea that there exists an invisible force that connects all living things, and that this force can be manipulated. So Swedenborg had introduced the idea that there are spirits all around us, and Mesmer had introduced techniques for manipulating an invisible force. Therefore, what happened was that people started to use Mesmer's techniques to try and contact the spirits of dead relatives. This became known as spiritualism, and it was all the rage in the mid-1800s. Although not as popular nowadays, spiritualists do still exist, and in the U.S. they have an organization called the National Spiritualist Association of Churches, founded in 1893. One of the earliest practitioners of mesmerism was a man named Phineas Quimby. He's considered the founder of the New Thought Movement, which is a philosophy that connects some of these 19th century metaphysical ideas with similar ideas from the ancient world. In 1889, this movement, combined with the Transcendentalist movement, inspired a couple known as Charles and Myrtle Fillmore to establish an organization called Unity, also known as the Unity Church. It sees God as more of a divine energy that connects all things and teaches that we can use our thoughts to change reality. Which brings me to the most successful of these metaphysical groups 
the Church of Christ Scientist, better known simply as Christian Science. The first thing you need to know about Christian Science is that it is not related to Scientology. Scientology was founded by L. Ron Hubbard in 1951 and has no historical links to Christianity. Hubbard, who was a science fiction writer, simply made the whole thing up from scratch. Christian Science, on the other hand, was founded in 1879 by Mary Baker Eddy, who happened to be a patient of Phineas Quimby. As the name suggests, Christian Science is connected to Christianity, which is why it gets a spot on this chart, but not Scientology. The second thing you need to know about Christian science is that it actually has very little to do with science, at least not mainstream science. In her book, Science and Health, with Key to the Scriptures, Mary Baker Eddy taught that the material world, including sickness, is really just an illusion. Therefore, instead of using medicine or physical therapy to treat health problems, Christian science practitioners simply use prayer. The idea is that by focusing on the fact that the physical world isn't really real, you can make physical health problems go away. According to Christian science, this is what Jesus did, and what we can do too if we follow Mary Baker Eddy's teaching. Interestingly, the Church of Christ Scientist is also the publisher of the Christian Science Monitor, which does not actually promote their religious views, but rather simply reports the news. It has won several Pulitzer Prizes and is generally seen as being a fairly unbiased news source. Okay, that takes care of the metaphysical groups. I now want to mention a few more non-Nicene churches, all of which developed in Asia. The earliest of these is Inglesia Ni Cristo, which is based in the Philippines. It was founded by Felix Manalo and is today run by his grandson, Eduardo Manalo. According to Iglesia Ni Cristo, Christianity in the West became false Christianity within the first few centuries. It points to a scripture in Isaiah which says, Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the East. As you can probably guess, Iglesia Ni Cristo believes that it is those descendants from the East. Like many of the other churches in this non Nicene section, it believes that it is the one and only true church, and that every other church on this entire chart is false. Even more extreme is the Unification Church, based out of Korea. Its followers are known as Moonies, named after the church's founder, Sun Myung Moon. Moon taught that he was the second coming of Jesus, and that it was his task to do something that Jesus hadn't done during his first coming, and that was to get married. Moonies believe in a special kind of marriage, one that removes the couple from Adam and Eve's sinful line and places them back in God's sinless line. This is why the Moonies are known for their mass weddings, which sometimes involve thousands of couples getting married at the same time. But if you think that's weird, it gets even weirder. After Sun Myung Moon died in 2012, a power struggle began between Moon's wife, Hak Ja Han, and their son, Hyung Jin Moon, which eventually led to the son forming his own breakaway church, called Rod of Iron Ministries. Based mostly in the US, it focuses on gun rights and gets its members to carry semi-automatic rifles during their wedding ceremonies and other rituals. Back in Korea, the Unification Church has now been eclipsed by a newer non-Nicene church, now known as the World Mission Society Church of God. Originally called the Church of God Jesus Witnesses, it was founded by a man named An Sung Hong, who had originally belonged to the Seventh-day Adventists. Because of these roots, the World Mission Society shares much in common with the Adventists, but they also developed some rather extreme beliefs, which include the idea that An Sung Hong was the second coming of Jesus. He has since passed away, and they now also see him as being God the Father and the Holy Spirit. And they see his wife, Zhang Gilja, who is still living, as God the Mother. Let's now move out of the non-Nicene box back to mainstream Trinitarian churches, 
and take a look at how Christianity has developed in China. Even though Christianity is followed by less than 5% of the population in China, in terms of sheer numbers, China is actually one of the most Christian countries on earth. According to some estimates, China now ranks 7 overall, which is higher than both Italy and Greece. But due to the communist government there, things are, well, complicated. Officially, there are only two churches in China, the Three Self Patriotic Movement, which is a coalition of Protestant groups, and the Catholic Patriotic Association, which is Roman Catholic. However, the vast majority of Christians in China do not belong to either of these two churches. For example, in 1957, when the Catholic Patriotic Association was set up, it was forced to reject the authority of the Pope in Rome, and therefore many Roman Catholics became part of an underground Catholic church instead. However, this is recently starting to change. In 2018, China and the Holy See agreed to a situation whereby the Pope now gets to sign off on bishop appointments. So it's yet to be seen how things will develop from this point forward. When it comes to Protestant churches in China, there are many house church networks that run independently from the three self-patriotic movement. The three largest are the Born Again Movement, the Fang Sheng Fellowship, and the China Gospel Fellowship. However, due to the situation in China, it's difficult to know exactly how many members belong to these organizations. It's likely, though, that these are some of the largest Protestant denominations in the world. I also want to point out a group known simply as Local Churches, which was established in China prior to the Communist Revolution by a man named Watchman Ni. This group was initially connected mostly to the Plymouth Brethren, but then went on to build connections with other evangelical churches as well. After the Communist Revolution, Ni was arrested and imprisoned, but one of his followers, known as Witness Li, continued to grow the movement in Taiwan and then later in the U.S., where he founded Living Stream Ministry. Okay, let's now move from China to Africa and look at a few churches that were founded by Africans. These differ from most churches in Africa, which were originally led by European or American missionaries. The earliest of these African-initiated churches is the Zion Christian Church, which is based in South Africa. But don't be confused by the word Zion. Zionist churches in Africa have nothing to do with the modern state of Israel. Surprisingly, the name actually comes from the city of Zion, Illinois, which was founded by a controversial figure named John Alexander Dowie in an attempt to create a modern-day theocracy. I call him controversial because, although he started out as a popular faith healer, he's now mostly known for having fraudulently made millions off his followers. However, the idea of creating a new city of Zion spread to other areas and became particularly popular in South Africa. It is for this reason that when a man named Anganas Lekanyane decided to start a church, he decided to call it the Zion Christian Church. Today, it is run by his grandson, Barnabas Lekanyane, and it has grown to become the largest denomination in South Africa. The next African-initiated church that I want to point out is based in Nigeria and is called the Eternal Sacred Order of Cherubim and Seraphim, although nowadays they like to use the acronym ESOX. It was founded in 1925 by a Yoruba man named Moses Arimolade, who supposedly performed many miracles. Today, Essox is the largest of the so-called white garment churches in Nigeria, also known as Aladura churches, Aladura being a Yoruba word meaning praying person. The words Karabim and Seraphim refer to two different types of angels. You're probably more familiar with the word cherub, which nowadays is used to refer to angels that look like little winged babies. Another popular church in Nigeria is the Redeemed Christian Church of God. I've shown it in red because it is a Pentecostal church. 
Many of the other African-initiated churches share certain Pentecostal elements as well, but they do not officially consider themselves Pentecostals, whereas the Redeemed Christian Church does. It was founded by Josiah Alufemi Akindeomi and is currently led by Enoch Adeboye. However, the one African-initiated church that really stands out as being different is the Kimbanguist Church, based in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It was founded in 1921 by Simon Kimbangu, back when the country was controlled by the Belgians. Kimbangu was another supposed miracle worker, but in this case he ended up being imprisoned by the white authorities because he also preached about black liberation. I've placed the Kimbanguist church in the non-Nicene box because eventually Kimbangu was seen as being the incarnation of the Holy Spirit, something that goes against Nicene theology. Nearby, I've also included a symbol representing the Rastafari religion, which developed in the 1930s, not in Africa, but in Jamaica. According to Rastafarians, Halle Selassie, the former king of Ethiopia, was the reincarnation of Jesus. So, although Rastafari is, in a sense, based on Christian ideas, it has since evolved into its own religion, which is why I've shown it as a black and white symbol instead of placing it in a colored box. Okay, the last group of Christians that I want to talk about are Messianic Jews. We've come full circle because Messianic Jews are Jewish Christians, which is what the very first Christians were. Let's therefore go back up to the top of the chart to recap. During the lifetime of Jesus, there were four main sects within Judaism. Of these four, only one survived the destruction of the temple, the Pharisees. It was the Pharisees who went on to become the rabbis, and therefore virtually all of Judaism today is considered to be Rabbinic Judaism. However, just before the destruction of the temple, a fifth sect emerged, which went on to become Christianity. In other words, Christianity started out as a sect of Judaism, which is why I've labeled this box Jewish Christians. However, from there, Early Christianity went in three very different directions. Those who rejected Jesus as God and continued to practice Jewish customs like circumcision and avoiding pork became known as Ebionites or Nazarenes. Both of these groups eventually went extinct, although before they did, they likely had a big influence on the development of Islam. On the other extreme were the Gnostics, who also went extinct. But in the middle were the Pauline Christians, who Christians today see as being the true Christians. From here, Christianity became a mostly Gentile or non-Jewish religion, although early on, there were still many Jews. However, the point I want to make, which I made in an earlier episode, is that there is no direct continuous line between early Jewish Christians and modern Messianic Jews. Jews who embraced pre-Nicene Christianity and then later Nicene Christianity were simply integrated into the now mostly Gentile church. Congregations made up primarily of Jewish Christians did not arise again until the 19th century with the start of the Hebrew Christian movement. In the US, the Hebrew Christian Alliance of America was established in 1915, although it later changed its name to the Messianic Jewish Alliance of America. Today, it is the largest of the various Messianic Jewish organizations, which is why I chose it to be kind of representative of Messianic Jews as a whole. Note that they fully accept the Trinity and all other aspects of Nicene Christianity, which is why they are shown within the main part of the chart. But the question a lot of people ask is, are Messianic Jews Jews or Christians? Or are they perhaps both? Well, according to all the modern branches of Rabbinic Judaism, from Reform to Orthodox, Messianic Jews are definitely Christians and not Jews. While many Messianic Jews were born Jewish and would show up as being Jewish on a DNA test, 
they are actually no longer considered to be Jewish by the greater Jewish community. This boils down to the fact that Judaism and Christianity share common roots, but because Christianity ended up being by far the larger and more dominant group, this has forced Judaism to define itself in part as being very deliberately non-Christian. In other words, one of the defining features of Judaism is that Jews do not believe that Jesus was God. Therefore, if a Jew converts to Christianity, they are no longer a Jew. Ironically, a Jew can stop believing in God altogether and still be considered a Jew. That's because Judaism is, in a sense, still a very tribal group. So long as you don't join another tribe, you're still a Jew. But if you do join another tribe, like the one that believes Jesus is God, you're no longer a Jew. Okay, so that concludes our look at the family tree of Christian denominations. A big shout out to Joshua from Ready to Harvest for helping me along the way. If you want to get a copy of the finished chart as a poster, you can do so now by heading over to our website, usefulcharts.com. And one more thing. A lot of people have asked me to do a similar family tree for other religions. So we will be doing that in the coming weeks, at the very least for Judaism, Islam, and Hinduism, each of which will consist of a single video. So keep an eye out for that. Thanks for watching.